I am happy to give the floor to our next speaker, Lucy. Mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon, Lucy. And Lucy is leading us to the medieval age, speaking about the old Czechish or Czech proverb, uh, which uh, were collected many, many centuries ago. The floor is yours, Lucy. Thank you very much. Uh, and hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I will try to share my PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. So indeed, today I would like to take you to a medieval Latin environment. Uh, without trying to um, propose a definition of a medieval Latin proverb, I would like to point your attention to some differences or specificities. In medieval Latin context, um, proverbs are very much mixed with maxims. So they are usually simply a succinct advices or orders, and we can hardly find anything folk uh, in the material. We can sometimes, but uh, that's not the norm. Also frequently, uh, these proverbs, sentences, or maxims um, are not very metaphorical and are not very obscure. So they are just simple <laughs> um, advices what you should do. The form uh, most frequently is two verses, leonine, so it rhymes and it has a particular number of syllables, but also uh, single lines are quite frequent. Uh, still until this day, the most useful repertory of medieval Latin proverbs are, is the pro uh, repertory by Hans Walter, which uh, has some 35,000 items. There is a lot of material, as I will try to show you today, which is still largely unexplored. Um, and uh, I would like uh, you to, uh, to invite you to have a look sometimes at the medieval context too, because it might be uh, interesting or revealing. I will concentrate today on uh, late medieval Bohemia, but the tendencies there are the same as elsewhere in Europe. On the one hand, we have individual proverbs. They may be uh, copied really individually in the manuscripts, or they may be used uh, in part, uh, as parts of sermons or at the end uh, of another text, there would, be, uh, there would be a proverb. But most frequently, they appear in mixtures, uh, in mixed notes, which would contain also recipes, riddles, mnemonic verses. So you, you get a sort of strange uh, mixture of things. And uh, this again points to the fact that it's not so easy to draw particular lines between what is proverb and, uh, and what is not. Uh, it would be great to be able to uh, describe the rationale behind these compositions. Uh, and we don't really know. In late medieval period, uh, these are frequently uh, personal notes. So one person writes for himself what he finds interesting or what comes to his mind. So uh, the, the mixture may be based just simply on association or it may be just ad hoc idea, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, The example I'm giving you here uh, is a sentence verse uh, an angel-like youth becomes Satan-like in his old age. This is a specific sentence because it is, it has, it had been discussed very much throughout the Middle Ages that it's an evil proverb, that it actually comes from the devil, because through this you discourage uh, youth to be good, to be nice, because if if they are nice in their youth, they would become Satan's in the old age. So. The context of education, which is the primary context for proverbs uh, in medieval Latin context, uh, doesn't seem to invite so much uh, this particular proverb. There is a really nice study on this by John Burrow, who actually shows how this proverb makes sense if you consider other aspects uh, of it. And I will leave you to read that because that's a nice study. The other example of uh, individually copied proverbs 
uh, is again this uh, ad hoc uh, creation. You see, this is a smaller piece of paper which is soon into a bigger codex with uh, just some notes. And here we have two proverbs that actually go against each other in their content. The first one reminds you of the fate of Icarus. And besides keeping uh, the orders of your father, you should also keep the middle course, not too close to the sun and not, not too close to the water. But the other one opposes and says, it's a great mistake to think that you should keep the middle line because the middle ones remain thirsty. It's the last ones who shall be nourished. Okay, so we have this juxtaposition without any further explanation. Besides individual proverbs, which are really omnipresent in medieval manuscripts and which have not been studied uh, in detail, and there is huge material, we have, of course, collections uh, of proverbs. I take here over the typology by Barry Taylor, who divides them into collections of ancient authorities, then Florilegia, which he divides whether they are organized according to the alphabet, according to the authors or according to the subject and then proverbs included within narratives but it would be collection of proverbs because there would be many of them for each of these groups we have many many examples some of the texts have been um, have been uh, uh, edited but many of the collections have not yet been edited so this is just a sample of some medieval bohemian manuscript uh, that we have Typically, the collections have like 100 to 200 items, and they are usually destined for father use, uh, for preaching, or more frequently for education. Proverbs were used to teach composition uh, at schools. In the medieval context, uh, as I have already noted about the mixtures, it's quite similar. They are <clears throat> in form, they are very similar to dietetical advice and advice on healthy lifestyle very particular religious uh, behavior advice and very st two strong uh, themes are memento mori and evil of women okay this these are the omnipresent topics what is there uh, as a an illustration to this slide you see that the first word is always the same that is femina and these are all the ways in which woman is harmful, in which she will destroy your life, in which she is deceitful, etc, etc. So a big medieval topic. All these examples that I have showed you, including the exemplary manuscripts for each of the collections of proverbs, we have them in many manuscripts, but we have them also, all these manuscripts that I have noted here, are in hand of Crux of Terch, of one single person. He was a very special person. He was a sort of graphomaniac. He copied whatever he came across. And so he copied a lot. He copied over 4,300 folia and he glossed over twice as many folia. So he was really a person wherever he came, he copied something. Uh, I am not done with exploring his manuscripts yet. It's a huge, material, but there are at least 2,000 proverbs, probably more. Uh, he also, so this is how he glossed manuscripts, you see, <laughs> he, he really covers the page totally. But he also writes a lot about himself. So whenever he makes a copy, he also note, no, noted where he made it and under what conditions. So we are able to reconstruct his itinerary we see where he was and what he was doing there, thanks to the colophones he left in his manuscripts. And most of the proverbs he copied, he copied while he was a teacher at school. So we have, again, this school context reconfirmed, this context of education reconfirmed as the uh, primary place where proverbs would be used and where they would function. What is interesting about him is that he was recopying. So there are many proverbs that he copied several times into different manuscripts. This is an example uh, of, of a proverb that he copies with minor variants. They are not very significant, but there are minor variants. It's not always the same. Um, how do we decide when we have more versions, which is the original one? Um, 
the methods uh, explored so far are simply the syllable count and rhyme. So it should rhyme if it's Leonine verse. So if it doesn't rhyme, there is probably some sort of corruption. There should the syllable count should also work, uh, and of course the meaning. So the things should things should still uh, make sense. Uh, but it's not a trivial question. It's it's not always easy to uh, to make uh, a dis to decide on this. Uh, this this is the example of minor variants, but we have also examples of sort of rewriting the text, of sort of uh, updating the text. This is uh, and we could you could say maybe this is not a proverb, but I still um, show it as uh, as an example. So we have three versions, or in Crux's hand, Jews, moneylenders, beggars, merchants. These four types make schism among people. And then Jews, shoemakers, decrifies, flagellants. These three types make schism in people. And finally, beggars, beguines, wickliffites, and Hussites. These four types make schism in people. Okay, so you see that uh, the situation changed, and uh, the Hussites were really those people who burnt your house uh, or your monastery and hurt everybody, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so the proverb or whatever it is, sentence, uh, gets updated. Uh, it's not stable. It's not settled. Uh, it changes uh, depending on the context. Uh, also in Crux's copy, we have the only surviving exemplar uh, of the only medieval Czech proverb collection, Proverbia Flaskonis, Proverbs of Flaska. So Crux's copy is second half of the 15th century, but the text is usually dated to second half of the 14th and consists of 239 items. These are very different from the Latin material that I have described. They are metaphorical, obscure, and they also include idiomatic uh, expressions. So totally different than the Latin. A lot of metaphor, a lot of obscurity. Some of them we don't understand till this day. These are just some examples. There are many also simple proverbs, many biblical proverbs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are many proverbs we can understand easily because there are parallels, like whose beer you drink, his song you should sing, he who pays the piper calls the tune, that you understand and you also understand why beer would appear in Bohemia instead of the piper. Uh, but then there are completely obscure uh proverbs and then uh, some that are just not translatable so i could not could not use them so the this collection we have only in crux's copy only thanks to crux we have this czech collection of proverbs is it actually a collection of proverbs Václav Fleischhans argued that it is not because here you see the table of contents to the manuscript where these proverbs of uh, Flaska appear. And there are several entries that have the word proverbia, and none of them are proverbs. All of them are excerpts from larger works, okay, sort of sentences from larger works. So Fleischhans argued that this was not a collection of proverbs, these were simply uh, proverbial expressions taken from a larger piece. But he did not find a larger piece, so <laughs> this question has to remain open. I just point your attention to this, that we are having something and we can't even simply call it a collection of proverbs without uh, any doubts attached to it. This whole manuscript A4, where the Flaschka's proverbs are included, is a really interesting one, which uh, contains many different school texts many uh, many usual school texts as well as less usual school texts, many grammatical notes, uh, theological errors, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And among others, it contains also a text I would like to briefly introduce here, which was totally neglected so far. It's a collection of over 500 proverbs, but it, nobody noticed this before because it's called metra per circulum ani, so meters for the year. And these proverbs are organized according to the Sundays of the liturgical year. So there are sections 
and each is devoted to a particular Sunday. In addition, every of the sections begins with characterizing that Sunday, characterizing the feast that is being celebrated on that Sunday, and only then come the proverbs. They are organized in strophes, um, in three to four, sometimes more verses, and the whole thing is a bit clumsy. There are some repetition, it, it looks more like a draft. Should we think it was made for preaching, that for every Sunday we would have the preaching section? I'm not sure, because these proverbs are usually unrelated. It would not be very easy to include them, integrate them into a meaningful sermon. Could it be for studying and composition? Yes, I am much more inclined to think this. First, because of uh, it being included in a school manuscript, the A4 but also because of its contents. Uh, in the margin, as you see on this picture, uh, there are notes from Uguzio of Pisa's Derivaciones, so uh, grammatical etymological text, which help you understand the individual words. So it is really more like for, for uh, students. Um, and I am about to end. I just wanted to exemplify a little bit. Should we think again about the rationale, how they are, they are put together? Is there some sort of reason why exactly these proverbs come with this Sunday? So far, I don't think so. I did not find any reason except for sort of first hand um, association. So here we have a Sunday for when we celebrate the first miracle of Jesus when he changed water into wine. And then the first proverb is about Dice, wine, Venus, by these three, I am made miserable, okay? <laughs> then you have the guta fluid, unda fluid, so some liquid like the wine. And then you have uxor casta, the importance of having chaste wife, which again, you could connect to the wedding at Cana, but uh, it's a very loose connection and the whole doesn't make some really super sense uh, as, as some um, reasonable unit. Uh, and finally, this is uh, just a final note about these summaries that always come at the end of the section. These are not proverbs as we know them. They seem to be really like created by the school kids maybe and summarizing the proverbs that were there before. Here, the first example is an example of simplified summary. So we have two proverbs. The one who threads on subtle things falls more frequently. And the second one, who sits lower doesn't fall deeper. And the summary is, who goes stupidly often falls. Well, <laughs> that's really a simplification. With the other one, though, the summary uh, directs us more to obscurity. So we have a proverb, a bath will not be of any use to a crow or a whore. The whore will not be clean, nor the crow white, thanks to the wave. And the summary, the crow will not be clean by the wave. So for this, we already need to know the cultural association, crow, black, never coming white, etc., etc., because otherwise a uh, crow will surely get clean when it is washed. It will not get white and the, war, the whore will not get clean. So it is summarized in a way that uh, is a little bit, um, ends up a little bit uh, in obscurity. Okay, <laughs> so that's all from me. I just wanted to show you the materi material. I am now a little bit overwhelmed by the richness of it, which I did not expect. Um, so I am a little bit at the loss and will be really grateful for your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lucy, for the very exciting and interesting uh, the time journey in the past. The crux is the name of the of the, it's the name of that lucky yeah. person who... Yeah, who, his name is Crooks. Yeah. Crooks. Thank you. Let's see the questions. We have a comment from uh, Christian uh, Granda. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. I think we all enjoyed uh, it. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Olti also wrote congratulations, congratulations to this New found just now the Dula Potsolo is where breaks is the 90 years. And um, uh, what what do you think what will be the future path in, in the, this research? Are you planning to continue or what will be the, the next step? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I would like to continue, but um, 
all in all, this, this is really too much for one person. So it's, it's really a bit uh, a bit overwhelming. So I will try to get some student slaves included or <laughs> something like this. So I started this. I am not a paramiologist, as you know, uh, and I started this uh, interested in uh, rewriting in the idea of medieval um, adjustments made by scribes. So you know, in the Middle Ages, every copy is particular and is different from any other. And there are I, there are some reasons why the scribe uh, makes changes he makes, but also he makes mistakes, of course. So it's it's always a challenge for uh, medieval Latinists to to decide what is a mistake and what is a, a purposeful, intentional change that wants to change the way the text is perceived. And Crux is a great example because he recopied many things many times. So you can, in theory, you can follow uh, his change of ideas. But in practice, this is not so <laughs> easy, obviously. So this is what I am I am uh, fighting now with or suffering with uh, this. Thank you very much, uh, Lucy, for your nice presentation. Uh, and we have some comments or questions from Miha. Is Tutoresh with the sister collocation or is a comma missing in between? Yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting. So uh, uh, you saw that in, in this variation, there was only tria genera. So there was the three types of people, although there were still four elements in the in the main text. So mm -hmm. I guess, again, this is a corruption. So originally there was a uh, shoemakers and wickliffites but then somebody changed the four into three and so they out of the four you somehow had to make three mm -hmm. and and uh, the shoemakers uh Franciszek Schmahel wrote an, a nice article about the, the Hasside shoemakers so the shoemakers in the Hasside movement became really synonymous with uh, wickliffites but okay. also with Hasside. So mm -hmm. uh, because the Hasside movement spoke to the common people and then the shoemaker becomes really the prototype of the um, of of the of this revolution. So mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, I put it like this, but in fact, uh, and it looks like this in the manuscript that these two are closer to each other. But in fact, this is not resolved. So you have four things and you call them that they are three. So mm -hmm. You know, okay. but this is so frequent in medieval manuscripts. So many unresolved problems mm -hmm. <laughs> appear there. So. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you.